<clears throat> so as I just said, uh, this is a, an overview of men's clothing from 1480 to 1530. Uh, this is the time period that's frequently referred to as Hispano-Flemish. Although if you uh, do research on this time period, you'll find that that is more of an art history term than a, a cultural or historical term. Uh, it describes a period in time uh, in which Spain was the uh, colonizer owner of the lowlands, the Netherlands, Flanders, <clears throat> and there was a lot of cultural and artistic flow back and forth between the two countries. So if you start to notice some similarities between the Spanish clothing that we'll be looking at and Flemish clothing of the same time period, uh, that's because there was a lot of uh, coexisting um, influences on each other. So let's look at some specifically men's clothing. And I go on a, a skin out schema. So we'll start with undergarments. Um, and men in this time period are pretty lucky because they have a, an assortment of undergarments. Um, you're not just restricted to plain old braids. <clears throat> so braids or bragas are defined. There's two primary, primary styles. They can either be short and closely fitted, as we saw with that opening panel picture, or they can be longer and fuller, which are more like the standard medieval braids. They were linen. They were always white. They tied at the waist, and oftentimes um, you might see their hosen, their upper hosen, tied into the waist points. And sometimes, I say sometimes, but also, but actually quite frequently, they were decorated along the seam lines. So one of the defining characteristics of this period was a heavy use of embroidery, of fabric embellishments, of uh, you know, uses of metal and metallic threads, um, an enormous use of brocades and velvets and extraordinarily expensive fabrics. I've also often described this period as, you know, the nobility wore, literally wore the labor of others on their back as a demonstration of their wealth because all of these materials that they used were extremely labor intensive for someone else. But your wealth was measured, your social capital was measured by your clothing. So your clothing would be an outward display of your status. So here we have three examples of underwear. We have the martyrdom of Santa Lucia on the left by Bernardo Martorell, where you can see a, a slightly fuller version with the tie around the waist. In the center from the altarpiece of San Vicente by Bernardo Mar Martorell. He's one of my favorites because of his very detailed paintings. Um, you see a pair of white linen braids with the uh, casing around the waist with a little tie, and they are probably either striped in the fabric or embroidered in stripes. And then on the far right hand side, if you prefer something a little more close fitting, these almost look like a modern brief. Um, they have a, a waistband with a tie around the waist, and then they appear to be embroidered on seams and in patterns. This is from 1515 to 1519, this particular painting. So you have some choices. <clears throat> Your other essential body layer is a camisa or a shirt. The defining features of this is that it's full through the body. Uh, they tended to have wide sleeves. They were long enough to tuck into the outer breeches. They seem to always have been white, usually linen, but sometimes silk or wool. The neckline could be rounded out or rounded close, or a square neckline or gathered into a collar. The square neckline seems to have been very popular for both men and women's clothing at this time. And sometimes the collar and cuffs of these shirts would be highly decorated. It's not entirely clear if the very decorative collar and cuffs were attached to the shirt or if they were somehow detachable for laundering. Um, many of the noble and um, royal inventories have so many camisas that it's possible that they just didn't launder them very often. They could have been spot cleaning as they went along. So here's some pictures. Um, 
what you see pretty frequently, the best way to get a look at shirts in this period are to look for images of soldiers or servants. And this is because these were two classes of people who wore less in the way of layers. So I know at one point, for example, Lorenzo had asked me about, you know, good options for people who live in Onstiora, which is, the, is Texas in the U.S. It regularly gets up over 100 degrees. Um, portraying a Spanish soldier or a German mercenary working for the Spanish would be a good option. As you see on the far left, this is a German mercenary who is basically wearing his base layers. You can see his shirt poking out through the leg of his trousers. You can also see the sleeve dropping out of the yellow sleeve of his doublet. You can see it poking through the small doublet. But generally, what a soldier would have worn would be the two pieces of underwear, so the bragas and the camisa, and then basically one outer layer of, you know, trousers, a doublet, and a pair of boots or a pair of shoes with, with hosen. So that's a, a pretty good option. And, and much like, say, 14th century English, as, as men of the period got hot, they tended to first shed lower layers. So they might take the bottom half of their body down to their bragas, and then eventually they would unbutton or untie their doublet so that it sort of dropped around their waist and hung from the waist, almost like, you know, the 80s fashion of tying your sweater around your waist. So, you know, you can get all the way down to just a shirt and underwear if it's really blisteringly hot. In the center, we see a serving boy with uh, his, his shirt poking out in all of the most fashionable places. And then on the far right, uh, this is uh, an image from the decapitation of St. John the Baptist. We have the executioner who basically is wearing his long shirt with a garment over it. And you can't see it, but he has short hosen that basically come to his ankles and a little pair of soft leather shoes. So like I said, you can get way down to low layers for a hot, a hot day or a busy day. So are there any questions about the two base layers? So those are basically your absolute essentials. You gotta have a shirt and you gotta have your underwear. Almost everything else is negotiable. Okay, so let's talk about middle layers. Middle layers were sort of the absolute necessity level of clothing to be considered dressed. You still, in general, would not just wear your middle layers out in public unless, as I said, you're a soldier, a laborer, or a servant. So your first option for a middle layer is a jubon or a doublet. Um, you might recognize this in French, it's jupon. Um, so we use that word pretty frequently in the SCA. It's worn over the shirt and would be attached to the hosen or your calzas bragas, which we'll cover it momentarily, with lacing. So if you look at the picture of the martyrdom on Mount Ararat, this, this fellow in the front, you can see the ties around his waist where his doublet is pointed to his calzas bragas. So it was all tied together as one piece. Most commonly you see a round or a square neckline. You can also have a high neckline with almost a mandarin collar or the deep v-neck that you see here where it would have been laced over either a stomacher or another layer. It was very closely fitted. So this is a highly tailored garment uh, tailored to the individual. And it would be made of fustian, wool, or linen with a cotton padding. So a lot of people ask about the use of cotton because there is sort of a, a slight myth that runs around the SCA that the Spanish wore a lot of cotton. Uh, we did as a culture. Spain consumed a lot of cotton, but it was largely for wadding or padding or for undergarments that most people wouldn't see. So it was very, uh, it was very unusual to see cotton in garments because it was still moderately expensive and the rough cotton wadding would be cheaper than 
yard goods that were cotton. There's two different types of kubon. There's the Castilian style, which has very narrow sleeves, and you can see that in this uh, martyrdom painting. And then there's what they call the French style, which have wider open sleeves. So let's look at a couple of examples of that. We are back to the altarpiece of San Vicente. You can tell I really love a lot of these because they have just like the perfect examples. Um, the soldier on the left is wearing a Castilian style doublet. You can see just barely between his arm here that he is tied into his doublet. His doublet is pointed to his pants on one side and it's loose on the other. Um, the Spanish in general at this point were really impressed and fascinated with German Lajkinec style. So you'll see a lot of that influence as well. Um, you know, the, the sort of slashed and multicolors. Um, and they saw, <clears throat> they saw the Lajkinec as sort of these dashing figures um, with the, this wild style. And they sort of adopted that and made it their own. Then in the middle, we have another a Castilian style doublet with a high collar. <clears throat> Likewise, on the far right, um, you can see his doublet is actually, you know, underneath this high-necked garment. He has a red doublet. And it could be argued that he's actually layering more than one hubon because the style that's on the outside is difficult to classify. Um, one thing that I, I frequently note is that I pull most of my information on the classification of clothing from Ruth M. Anderson's Hispanic Costuming, 1480 to 1530. The book was published in the 70s, and um, I, I have come to believe over about 20 years of studying Spanish fashion that some of her classifications are a little more arbitrary. So there seems to have been some blurred lines between categories. So I divide them up this way for easy, ease of teaching, but you may find for your own research that you prefer to make your own categories for things. And, and that's perfectly fine. Um, that's a perfectly valid way to go about it. Uh, you can also see with his doublet that his sleeves are tied together in so many places. Uh, sleeves had a life of their own. In Hispano-Flemish Spain, they were generally considered to be separate garments, both for men and women. They were cataloged in inventories independent of garments, um, and they could be enormously complex or extraordinarily simple. Um, so just a tip, uh, I like to do something in my own wardrobe that I refer to as my Hispano-Flemish Geranimales. So if you remember Granimal's clothing for folks in the U.S. Uh, from the 70s and 80s, they were these sort of colored clo coated children's clothing, and um, they were made to mix and match. The mixable sleeves uh, provide you a really easy way to mix and match. You can create multiple garments, multiple looks with one garment and eight sets of sleeves. Okay. So we have a, a question. Uh, mm -hmm. They're right. Uh, could those points be there for armor? Um, it's possible, although they're they're actually rarely seen with those sleeves. Points are actually rarely seen with people who are actually wearing armor. It it seems to be a purely civilian style. I'm reluctant to say absolutely yes or absolutely no, um, especially given, I, you know, I'm, I am a female person teaching about male persons and I, I no longer fight in armor. Um, I would love if somebody out there would, would make that and point it to armor and let me know how that works uh, as, a, as an extra point of, of research. So um, I, I'm not going to say yes or no either way, Ilaria. I know that's not terribly helpful, but that, that is definitely a place where more research could be done. Okay. Are there any other questions? 
Okay, let's hit the lower half of the body because everybody, everybody always wants to know what to cover their legs with. Uh, your lower garments, uh, the primary would be the calzas or the hosen. These came in three primary styles. So they could be split with a cod piece that would be attached, such as you see in the painting here. So basically the cod piece is a flap uh, that comes up between the legs and fastens in the front. This evolved into what we more readily recognize as a cod piece in the 16th century, but it did just sort of start out as a modesty panel, basically. They could be short to the thigh or the knees, so you could either have full length calzas or short calzas to the thigh or knee. Also, they could be joined at the between the legs, sorry, with a seam. So they, we call those um, joined hose. So they look more like modern tights. You put them all on as one piece. Sometimes these come sold with leather. So they basically have built-in shoes um, and they would wear over shoes to go outside. They're cut on the bias for stretch. So if you've ever made your own hosen, you know that one of the worst things, one of the worst ways to get fit is to cut it on the straight grain. Um, because you will never be able to get it over all the curves. Um, it just doesn't, just doesn't quite work very well. Uh, in general, they seem to have been wool, a very fine wool, or leather. So leather was pretty popular, especially among uh, that soldier laborer uh, strata of society. And then after the 15th century, they were usually knitted. So Spain has a really interesting um, history with knitting and they were using knitted garments, um, largely sleeves and hosen uh, into the 16th century. And you can find these highly decorated like the rest of the clothing, uh, decorated with bands or panels of wool, silk, or velvet. And just a bit of trivia, when you see the stripes um, or embroidered stripes, in Spanish those are called tirases. And that is from the Arabic word, word tiraz. So if you have studied any Muslim costuming or Andalusi costuming, you'll know that the tiraz bands were embroidered bands that the men wore around their upper arms that were usually uh, prayers or invocations or pieces of poetry. Um, and Spain hung on to that piece of decoration after, well after the expulsion of the Moors. And they hung on to it to the point that they sort of culturally lost the idea that the decoration were words. So you'll see these terraces that look like Arabic scripts, but when you actually try to translate them, you find out that they're just, they're just you know, they're just decorative symbols. It's gibberish. So they're just, they're recreating the look without the content. And eventually, uh, tirases became just strips or stripes. So on the left here, uh, Juan de Juanes' altarpiece of San Vicente, you can see a full length pair of calces. Uh, I love Juan de Juanes because he shows us that the, they wrinkle at the, the ankle. So if you're one of those folks who find that, you know, your hosen get a little baggy around the knees and around the ankles over the course of the day, so did theirs. You're, you're recreating period style. Um, you can see the seam up the back and then he has a pair of little shoes on uh, little slip-on leather shoes. Uh, you can also, uh, on his foreleg, his right leg, you can pretty well see all of the seams that go in. So it almost looks like it's cut like a pair of stirrup pants, then seamed to a piece for the front of the foot, and then seamed to the sole. If I had been thinking when I put this together, I would have traced out that seam line for you guys, but it, it was late. <laughs> Uh, so in the center, you see another uh, German-influenced style with the multicolor strips. These are full-length calces joined between the legs, also worn with little garters uh, tied around the upper leg. And you can see 
how closely these fit and this style of fit would have required a bias cut to get that snugness. And then to the right, you see the Adoration of the Shepherds. This is a working class gentleman. This is a shepherd. He's wearing his shirt um, partially tucked up probably into his, into his uh, bragas, into his underwear. And then he has rolled down his hosen. Um, it may be warm. He's working hard. And then he has little lace-up shoes that look very much like Irish ghillies. So there's an option for folks who are looking for footwear. Okay, so let's talk about Calzus Bragas, which is a particular type of garment, or bre breech hose or breeches. Um, so these are separate breeches that were sometimes laced to the chubon or the doublet. They'd be highly decorated, like the piece on the left, long enough to reach the top of the hosen, and sometimes found with lacing holes to attach to the hosen. And then they would be covered with the skirting from the outer layer. So these are, the best way I can think of to describe them is they are a pair of shorts that goes on over your hosen. So you can either wear the sort of, uh, you know, hosen arrangement attached between the legs and, or with a cod piece, or you could wear two separate hosen or connected hosen with the causus bragus over it. Um, this picture on the left, again, is really useful because you see all the points from the causus bragus hanging down, and you can see the corresponding lacing holes around the base of the chubon with his shirt peeking out. And then if you look at his left leg, you know, he is, he is minus um, some pieces of his clothing there, and uh, his shirt has come untucked underneath his trousers. You know, he's got his sleeves rolled up. You can even see the seaming in the back of the huban. And then those, those beautiful black applique stripes um, to sort of accentuate the body. And then the edge, so these are probably wool, would be my guess. And the edge pieces are made by basically just folding the wool over sewing it into the edging and then you can snip those little tabs and if it's full wool they won't fry so that's a quick and easy decorative and like i said these are very influenced by german lounge connect fashion um, you can see a near equivalent in most of the lounge connect style this is where you can get really crazy so if you are a guy or know a guy who likes really flashy clothing but wants to be spanish uh, these causes bragas are fabulous for that. Uh, you can see on the left uh, from the Maestro de Altira uh, these wonderful spiral slashed causes bragas. His match his hosen. Um, so the causes bragas end where what looks like a double welt or a double ruffle. Again, he's got the little soft shoes on. This one has more of the type of codpiece that we're familiar with, um, and it's got some slashing and puffing. So, like I said, very, very, very flashy. He's actually wearing a, a, um, a breastplate. So this would be a spot for folks who want to know if things are tied or pointed to armor. Um, grab this picture and um, blow it up. Um, there are lots of full-size images on the web where you can get really close in uh, high detail. So um, you might be able to answer that question for me. Um, then in the middle, we've got, you know, multi-stripes. These are four different colors going on here. All, you know, striped all the way around the leg, fitted pretty close, but otherwise fairly plain. You know, not a lot of decorative additions. And then on the far right, one of my favorites from the Road to Cavalry. Um, you know, this is just where you can get wild and crazy. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's quartered, so you have stripes on the top of one and the bottom of the other, white stripes, you've got chevrony, um, you've got everything. I could see these done up in heraldic, uh, a heraldic pattern, you know, especially if you are lucky enough to have checky, um, that would be fabulous. It's a, it's a great time for well-dressed men. <laughs> so those, that set of layers that I've already covered are, like I said, your absolute necessity for being at least somewhat dressed. Cheki, Elisheva. Cheki is, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, 
basically checkered. Um, so if you think of like a checkered flag, um, or like a chessboard, thank you, thank you, Juana. I, I had that in my head and I could not get the word. So yeah, checky is like a chessboard, usually alternating of a color and a metal. So like red and white or blue and gold. So um, it can be super fun. You can turn it on the diagonal and then you get, you know, what looks like alternating diamonds. So you can have a lot of fun with these styles uh, as, a, as a seamstress or a tailor. Oh, yep, yep, no problem. Oh gosh, how would the black and white pair have been made? Um, so my best guess, Catherine, is that they would have, they would have pieced the fabric first. So you do two separate lengths and piece the black and white vertical stripes out of yardage and then piece the chevrony out of yardage and then cut your pieces and assemble them. Um, other than, other than brocades, I'm trying, I'm, I'm slowing down because I'm making sure I got this right. Elisheva, I don't think applique either piecing or my other my other instinct is to say it would be a woven in pattern but there's no reason why you couldn't try applique i mean they could have been knitted yeah i mean after after the end of the 15th century knitting is knitting is entirely appropriate Um, I, I also kind of think some of them could have been painted because many of the pairs that we see may have been leather. So there's a possibility that it could have been, yeah, that, that was my big question about applique, is that if you applique over bias cut, then you're going to have points where it doesn't stretch quite right. Uh, yeah, no joke. Knitting is easier than piecing. Then, then again, I'm not a quilter, so... Um, did I miss anybody's questions? Oh, yeah, you're right, Juana. Lozenge. So the diamond pattern is lozenge because it's made up of lozenges. So. Okay, let's go ahead to our top or outermost layers. Um, these were required for the well-dressed man to be considered fully dressed. Now, if you are a younger fellow in Spain, um, you can get away with a lot less formal a style in public than older gentlemen with a position to maintain. Um, young men were sort of expected to be a little wild and hairy uh, in Spain at this time. You know, they did, they wore their hats in silly ways and they were, you know, often, uh, cited as, you know, being responsible for street brawls. Um, they were sort of expected to get up to, to mischief. Um, so they weren't necessarily expected to meet all the dress standards that were applied to the nobility, you know, to the nobility. So, you know, much like teenagers today, our expectations of young men are a little bit different. So your first outer layer is a sayo or a jerkin. And sayo or sayuelo or saya is just the Spanish word for gown. So this is your outer gown. It's usually full through the body with very long skirts to the knee or the mid thigh. And the skirts were often cartridge pleated or roll pleated or stuffed. Uh, the pleats would be stuffed to make them nice and full so they stand out. It'd be open down the front with that, you know, round square or collared neckline. Um, usually cinched at the waist in some manner. They were generally made of silk or wool, silk brocade or velvet, padded with cotton, linen, or silk wadding. This is one of the only places that I see a lot of mentions of silk wadding in the, the inventories. And then they'd be decorated with slashes or bands of silk, wool, or velvet. And the richer ones would then also be decorated with gems or metal pieces or embroidery. They were very fond in general of decorating with pieces of metal, little dangling pieces of metal. Um, one of Isabella, Isabella's gowns had 
seven and a half inch high metal letters around the hem that spelled out her and Fernando's motto. And then Fernando had the first letter in like four inch pieces sewn all over one side of his hubon for that event. So, you know, little pieces that look like animals or vegetables or heraldic or letters, very popular. Okay, three examples here. Uh, Carlos V as a Magi on the far left. This is a very dignified look. So you can see his doublet underneath and then his gown is the reddish pink over top with rows and rows and rows of ornamentation, either braid or trim work or embroidery. And then he's wearing a, a coat over that with the hanging sleeves. So um, an enormous amount of fabric at this point. In the center, you can see those nice full cartridge pleats with the decoration around the edges. Again, he's wearing his little slippers to go with it. The, the slippers were very fashionable. Um, it's a really nice set of, of doublet sleeves underneath, very full at the top and then gathered tight from the forearm to the wrist. And then on the far right from our friends, the 10,000 Martyrs, um, you have an overgown that shows the fastening down the front. I apologize for my commentator here. Um, you'll, you're going to be joined by Black Cat for a couple of minutes. Um, but again, with the full skirt, and he's got his collar sort of rolled down. It's probably wilted a little in the, the stress of, of his ordeal. Okay, let's talk about hats, which is my favorite thing. Um, hats and headgear is what got me into Spanish fashion, um, because if you are a person who likes hat, hats, you have come to the right place. Um, under the reign of Isabella, all noblemen were required to own Spanish-produced wool felted hats. They had to have at least one. Um, Elisheva, the sayos usually fastened down the front. Um, I believe that some of them also fasten under the arm because you see, you'll see the very flat, smooth front. So either under the arm or there's a piece that fastens over, uh, like the English Tudor style. I will say for convenience sake, it's a lot easier to fasten them down the front. Um, and most of them seem to either to have been tied or used something almost like China, the little Chinese knot fasteners, the frog, we call them frogs, or pinned, lots of pins. So usually if you can see an, an opening line and you can't see fasteners, they're probably pinned closed. And just so you're aware, we have almost 20 minutes left. Okay, awesome. Going right on time. So, all right, so let's talk about hats. As I said, Isabella made it a law in Castile, Aragon, that all noble men had to own at least one Spanish produced wool hat. And this was to bolster uh, Spain's wool economy and the hatting industry in general. So, there is a huge body of literature around the etiquette of men's hats. It's very fascinating. Um, much, much insults taken for people not taking their hat off at the right time or to the right people, and one duke becoming terribly offended because another duke didn't take his hat off, and he was never going to take his hat off to that duke again, and in fact would cross the street when he saw him. So, you know, that sort of um, machismo that you, you often see in, in Spanish culture at the time uh, was really um, sort of supported by the hats. Uh, let's see, so our first uh, little set of hats are sort of a, a skull cap type arrangement uh, called a Carmenola. And this is a great place for younger men to wear their hats in ridiculous ways because the brims of these would be split and you could flip them up at all kinds of angles. Uh, sometimes the little splits would be tied together as in the center with ribbon. Or you can see on the right, um, <clears throat> this is technically supposed to be a, fix, uh, uh, a depiction of either a Jew at the marriage of Cana or potentially Judas at the marriage of Cana. 
Um, it can be a little unclear, but you can see he has a skull cap, the brim down in the front, and then flipped up all the way around. Um, I often say they look like uh, the hats that Jughead from the Archie comics or from Riverdale, the TV show, wears um, with the flipped up brims. So these would be almost uniformly felted wool um, and, then, and then cut and folded into, into position. Okay, then you have a gora, which means cap. These are a little larger, larger brims. They tend to be soft instead of very structured, and they would often be worn over the skull cap, so you can layer hats as well. Um, the one on the left has a tied brim again. Here's the tie. And then the one on the far right has this lovely contrasting brim. Um, my guess would be silk satin. It's got a lovely sheen to it. Um, it, it might be velvet. I love the sort of the sort of nap that you can see. Um, Juana Isabella is saying her husband has done some shaped felt hat if anyone needs help figuring out how to do that. Thank you. Thank you for that offer. Okay, uh, flat caps, very popular, uh, actually a direct influence from England. Um, I love the one on the far left in the epiphany where you can see that the crown of the hat has been snipped into loops. Um, and then the far right, another picture of Carlos V with his flat cap, which is tied to his head um, with a little decoration. You see there are feathers. Um, so the fellow on the far left, you know, things have been flipped up and flipped down and he's wearing a, a crown on his head over his hat. So they've got to keep wearing the hat at all costs. And then bonetos, which are kind of my favorite. Um, these are the soft, large crowned hats. Um, usually with a split brim. So you can see in the left-hand picture, the front brim is turned up and the back is turned down to sort of protect the head. And then on the right, this picture is amazing. Um, uh, it's amazing because there are so many things going on here. The brim is flipped up in the back and then there's the strap that goes around the chin. I could not get the whole brim of the hat in the picture because it was so long. Um, yeah, the ones with the actual bills, they are amazing. Um, they look like, almost look like a combination of a baseball cap and a hunting hat. Yes, yes, St. Martin visits the Valentinian Emperor, all the people and a woman in a boat. <laughs> so, which sort of captures the occasional ridiculousness of religious paintings. Yes, um, the stylus could be felted or knitted and fold. It depend on the, depended on the hat workshop that they came out of. I, I have not done shaped felt, but I've done knitted and fold hats. Okay, and then you have the bag hat, which is super simple. You know, it's a bag with, with an extended brim that you put on your head. Um, uh, some of them um, were made stiff enough to stand up and others, like the one on the left, flopped over. Um, I love these because they're super easy. You know, they're very stylish. You basically just make a tube and gather it closed at one end. So, uh, and then the capirote or the hood. And this is going to look familiar to anybody who's looked into like 14th or 15th century English or French. Because basically they take the standard medieval hood, put the face on top of their head, and then wrap the lira pipe around and let the skirting flop over. And that eventually develops into a separate garment. So on the left, you can see it's kind of like a bag hat without the gathered end. And on the right, you can see this very formal thing that, um, that uh, were worn by uh, the Catholic cardinals. So this one in the forefront. Okay, so let's talk about shoes. Um, one of the most common mistakes that we make in the SCA, especially um, men, are the constant wearing of boots. Um, especially in Spain, but mostly across Europe, boots were not really an everyday wear item. They were specialty wear. Instead, what you get are soft shoes. Um, and here is a lovely uh, selection of really simple soft shoes that you could wear. 
uh, the far right is really highly decorated, while the one in the middle is very simple. So yeah, if you want to sort of up your look, soft shoes. And then you have pantuflos or patens, which were basically slippers that you would wear over your calzas or your, your sold calzas. So if it has a leather sole on the bottom of the hosen, you don't want that to wear away. So if you're just shuffling around the house, you would wear slippers. It's also on the far right, this is actually a Portuguese image, but this is a Portuguese scholar who's wearing closed-toed mules, basically, over his hosen as part of his academic dress. You have sandals, sandalia. Very, very simple sandals, um, mostly just cord and a sole, although you also have something called alpargatas, which are straw or rope sandals or shoes. So the middle picture is a pair of straw shoes. The right hand picture is a pair of straw shoes with patterns over it. So those wonderful uh, woven rope sandals that you can get pretty much anywhere are, are perfect for summer wear. And then you have boots. And boots were largely, like I said, purpose specific. You'd wear them if you were hunting or riding or going into battle. Oh, we got a chat question. Yes, yes. Um, SCA Iberia had a link for the rope sandals. Um, so if you were part of SCA Iberia, somebody has, has linked us to a source. Yes. Gomez, yes. Borsegas. Those would be perfect. I mean, they still, they still make them today in Spain and in Mexico. They're still made in the traditional style. So um, they're pretty much the closest thing that you're going to get to period sandals. Awesome. Make them. Do it. I support this. Um, I love the fact that with these boots, they've not missed the opportunity to decorate something. On the far right, you can see that the seam of the boot is embroidered. So, you know, decorate everything. Embroider everything. All right, um, my sources, if you are deep into doing uh, Spanish costume of this period, uh, the Hispanic costume 1480 to 1530 by Ruth Matilda Anderson is basically your Bible for this time period. Uh, the problem with this is the Hispanic Society of America is down to its absolute last supply of this book and at the moment they have no plans to reprint it so if you find a copy for a reasonable price snatch it up immediately um, the same thing happened with the trajes y modas en la españa de los reyes católicos by carmen bernice um, those books are currently going on uh, amazon for about 120 a volume um, for what is basically a 60-page book of pictures. My other all-time best source is the Opus Incertum Hispanicus blog. Um, Consuela, the owner, has done an amazing job of collecting images and writing descriptions. It is in Spanish, but Google Translate will get you reasonably close to... Um, to being able to read it. Um, she's really good about answering questions. Um, she is pretty fantastic about getting back to people. So um, I've always found her really, really easy to work with. 